Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Ibrahim Aoudeh. Education, budget, economy, and legislation, our topic for tonight. And to discuss this, we have with us uh, Senator Jill Tokuda. She's chair of the Education Committee, um, Senate Education Committee. Uh, we have um, Senator Will Espero, he's chair of the Public Safety and Intergovernmental Affairs Committee. And he's also on other committees as well, including the Ways and Means in the Senate. And uh, Senator uh, Tokuda, you are also on the Higher Education Committee as a member. Yes, and Ways yeah. and Means as well. Yeah, <laughs> and all Ways and Means as well. Very good. So that's why we put uh, the budget in uh, <laughs> the mix of uh, this in the title. And uh, Professor Okamura is also on the Curriculum Committee of the Department of Ethnic Studies. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, but he is... Um, uh, a keen observer of the uh, lo of local politics and also global politics, but now we are talking about uh, local politics. And he has written uh, a number of books and writing a book at uh, this uh, as we speak, uh, so to speak. And uh, so we shall have uh, some discussion about now that the um, legislative session has ended. Okay, well, what is it that uh, you know we waking up to what in terms of? the politics, the economy, especially in terms of education and, you know, and this relationship to the budget, relationship of the budget to the economy, and uh, what uh, uh, things uh, were in your minds as you were talking uh, and trying to vote and discuss the, those kinds of legislation. Would you like to start, uh, Senator Tokuda? Okay, I, I can start there. You know, definitely I think with the closing of the legislature last week, it feels like quite some time ago, though, um, I think we did end off on a very high note when it came to education in terms of the kind of opportunities that we've created all the way from early learning through higher education mm -hmm. for us to really um, change the game. Mm -hmm. And from early learning, we passed the constitutional amendment bill that will put a question before voters in mm -hmm. 2014 asking how we can approach our publicly funded early learning system and if we can partner with private providers. Mm -hmm. This is very significant. This is going to take Hawaii out of being of the minority of states that do not publicly fund early learning. Mm -hmm. So this is a very significant step. Mm -hmm. We also put in place a school readiness program, which means that we are going to be creating opportunities for our youngest keiki. In the K-12 system, we really looked outside of the box when it came to how we're going to create 21st century schools to change the way we teach and the places in which we teach, bring communities in. And that was the 21st mm -hmm. um, century schools bills and the public lands bills mm -hmm. that you saw pass. And for higher education, there was a lot of debate and discussion, and I think that's going to probably continue well on past session. Um, but we did also talk about various issues really relating to accountability. But one of the big things that we did pass was the state authorization uh, legislation that I've worked on for the last three years. What that did was made sure that Title IV federal student aid for Hawaii students was safe. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we had to pass by this session. The legislature did, in fact, do that. So across the board for education, mm -hmm. huge opportunities, huge gains. Mm -hmm. Um, Senator Espero, could you like elaborate on this and uh, what other bills uh, would you like to talk about um, in terms of public safety, the budget and so forth? Well, budget-wise, uh, we're fortunate that uh, we didn't have to be too concerned like we were in previous years. Mm -hmm. you know, two, three, four years ago, uh, we had to look at the budget from the perspective of cuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we had some billion dollar cuts within our system um, across the board statewide. Uh, this year, um, that wasn't the case. Uh, last year, we had a record year with tourists mm -hmm. and our general excise tax revenue was up. And the last Council of Revenues also gave us a very favorable number in terms of the revenues that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big budget items that we were watching were the uh, collective bargaining figures for our public mm -hmm. unions. And that was one of the big issues that uh, we had to wait till the very end because depending on the numbers and what was approved and negotiated, you know, would determine what we would have left over for our other CIP and bills and, and the budget as a whole. Mm -hmm. So this year, um, as Sanders said, we were able to provide some funding in education. We put some money into UH CIP as well. And overall, um, uh, we were able to um, look at the past um, 
takeaways. For example, we took money from the rainy day fund. Uh, this year, we're able to put money back in the rainy day fund. Uh, we um, took some money out of the hurricane relief fund. Uh, we were able to put $100 million back in the hurricane relief fund. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the um, unfunded liabilities for our health care for the um, government workers. And we created a formula, the first in the nation, uh, where we'll be taking money off the top of the revenues in the state and also the counties as well to deal with our um, billion dollar shortfall in unfunded liabilities that the state has to pay. So we're now able to, to be a little more proactive in, in shaping the budget in a positive way versus thinking nothing but cuts. Okay, great. Uh, before I go to Professor Okamura, um, I interviewed uh, Representative Rota Kumi uh, on Monday actually. And so he's, uh, he was unable to come here, so I went to the legislature uh, to do so. And he's talked about uh, some of the uh, things that uh, we have uh, so far mentioned. So we'll do that, and then we'll have uh, Professor Okamura uh, talk more, and then we discuss what uh, Representative Takumi had said. So we'll go to that one, and then we talk. The first bill that we have is the Constitutional Amendment. So in the 2014 election, the voters will be asked, would you support using public dollars to be used for private preschools? Now, 40 other states have a state preschool system and they operate in this fashion. Um, I know the teachers union said that this is vouchers, but actually it's not vouchers because you're basically saying, here's some public dollars and you as a parent can put your child in this preschool, but only this preschool or that preschool. A voucher is I give you money and you can just take it anywhere you want. And um, I'm opposed to vouchers, obviously, for K-12 or even at the university level, but preschool is done by the private sector, just like construction, um, jobs like that. You know, we don't have state workers building bridges and so on. We contract that out to the private sector. So um, I think between now and the next few years, we're really going to start Hawaii and be the 41st state to have a state subsidized preschool. The second bill that I was involved with that I'm very happy with was a domestic workers bill of rights. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawaii became the second state after New York. New York passed it in 2010. So for the first time in our state, people who work in people's homes will be protected under the law against discrimination and they will also fall under our wages and standards law. So they have to get paid the minimum wage, they have to get paid overtime if they work more than 40 hours in a week and so on. Uh, these are workers that traditionally do jobs like housekeeping or caretakers, people like that. For many, many years these workers had no protections. Now states can give rights to workers and so if you recall when Cesar Chavez started up the United Farm Workers in California, and it spread. Now, generally speaking, farm workers have the right to organize and get basic benefits, health care, vacation, sick leave, and so on. There are about two and a half million domestic workers in the country. And so after New York did it, Hawaii became the second state. I think California will be the next state. So hopefully the time will come in our country where these workers will have some basic rights. So I'm, I'm very happy with that bill as well. Well, here we go. I mean, he like elaborated a little bit about uh, on some of the things you mentioned in terms of uh, early childhood and so forth. So, um, Professor Okamura, any comments on what you have heard thus far? Well, when I first heard about this proposal, one of my concerns was the DOE schools are already underfunded. So this would be a further drain on the funds available for K-12 education. But <clears throat> the benefits for school education have been established and this is a way to uh, I think uh, provide minority students particularly that advantage by having access to preschool which is very expensive it's, it's just like sending your child to a, a private school mm -hmm. in kindergarten mm -hmm. so this is one of those means I see as providing for that equal educational opportunity and doing it through uh, the state providing that kind of access and, and like Roy says it uh, these are all private schools that operate the preschool, private institutions that operate the preschools anyway. So uh, that's how the money has to be allocated to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, the, other, the other thing yeah. is funny is uh, uh, 
if I could comment about that bill uh, providing those benefits to um, domestic workers. More than 40 years ago, I was a gardener at uh, Doris Duke's estate on Black Point. Mm -hmm. And whenever she came to Honolulu, we'd have to work Saturday mornings raking leaves. Mm -hmm. And we would not get overtime. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it because uh, I, I've been working in California before, and we'd always get, I'd always get overtime working more than eight hours a day, more than 40 hours a week. And uh, I found out it's because I was classified as domestic worker. Even though I didn't go in the house, I was working out in the yard. But the richest woman in the world figured out a way she could rip me off, me and the other guys. That's why they were rich. Yeah. Yeah. She, she doesn't like to squander her money. Absolutely. I was getting minimum wage anyway. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, that's that's good. Uh, anything else? Or, yeah, yeah. If I, I could comment on what Roy said, and obviously we were very pleased with the passage of the Constitutional Amendment Bill, and it did get the requisite two-thirds mm -hmm. majority in both the House and the Senate, which allows it to go straight to the ballot mm -hmm. in 2014 as required. Um, but I think really the, the important thing to note here, too, is that um, it is a public-private partnership that would be created when we put together this system, and that's because it would be the most efficient and effective model um, that we could really do. Now, you could look at it from perhaps the side of what the, the teachers union and others have said. Well, you could completely do it in the public realm, which would mean, you know, doing it all in public schools, adding just another grade, compulsory grade essentially, um, unionized and whatnot. But you have to keep in mind, we have never done that before. So from a capacity standpoint, whether it be from a workforce capacity, a facilities capacity, mm -hmm. everything, we'd be starting from below ground zero, practically. Mm -hmm. The private providers in the state have been the ones shouldering the burden of early childhood education for the last 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. They're the ones with experience. So it's about most effectively partnering with those mm -hmm. who have been doing it to make this program work and make sure that tax dollar is used most efficiently and effectively to educate and get our school kids ready for school when they enter kindergarten and I think it's important to note too that as we build this public private system that's not to say that we may not have some kind of public portion involved and that's something that we're working to create as well because you will have communities where private providers do not exist mm -hmm. and we'll have to create mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. but it's about having this option available to us yeah. and that's what Roy was talking about is that in 40 other states across the country right. you've got those kind of partnerships available but we are a strong Blaine Amendment state separation of church and state. So we've got to do this con am mm -hmm. to give us those opportunities and options so that we can most effectively stretch that state taxpayer dollar to serve the most amount of children across the board mm -hmm. so that no matter where you live, no matter what your social economics are, you can have those opportunities to be ready mm -hmm. to learn and be ready to succeed. And I think that's really, it's going to take a lot of education to get to that point and building the system, but that's really what we're trying to work towards. Yeah, but um, if I may say, so long that, uh, so long as the uh, private uh, system, private school system, abides by the labor laws and oh, uh, really not uh, exploit uh, the teachers or you know the workers in absolutely. that program, but not only in that program, but in the private school system as a whole, I think this is very important. So. Well, are there um, certain, uh, gar uh, you know, like guards or guarantees for that? Uh, and not to, to hog the discussion here yeah. about early learning, but part of the ballot question does have this little tagline on it that says, as provided by law. Mm -hmm. And that means that the program is allowable and private providers can participate, but as provided by law. And that's a really important three little words that we have mm -hmm. in there because that means that the legislature and, and what the statute dictates, they need to abide by those particular parameters as well as rules which have the force of law. Mm -hmm. um, the bill that we're going to continue to work on next year, which would be the enabling legislation mm -hmm. to set up the early childhood education program, make it really crystal, crystal clear, redundantly clear, mm -hmm. you must follow all state and federal laws. Here are the qualification parameters, mm -hmm. all of these different things. So there are standards that would be mm -hmm. put into place state laws, mm -hmm. federal laws that they could not obviously mm -hmm. disregard. Yeah. Um, but that as pr provided by law is so important mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, that this is not ever going to be a voucher program. It's not about a voucher system. Um, and that, you know, it's statutorily and through rules can really be maintained clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Senator. Part probably. of this discussion yeah. too is that um, regarding kindergarten and junior kindergarten, um, mm -hmm. Uh, we will no longer be having junior kindergarten. It will just be kindergarten. Now, one concern I do have with this measure um, 
is, uh, there's going to have to be a significant outreach and education um, for the voters mm -hmm. uh, because uh, this is something that will go to the people and one concern I have is that it is rejected. So hopefully there will be the advocates and the people that support this so they clearly um, allow the voters to understand how the money will be spent and like the, the concern you brought up mm -hmm. about following the laws and the impact on the private um, religious schools, for example, that has come up. So the, the outreach on both sides is going to be very important on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Representative uh, Takumi also talked about uh, what you mentioned earlier about the improving economy and the, how the funds were replenished. I want to play that quickly. It's less than a minute. And then we move forward from there. If you look overall, uh, we do have some resources. The economy has been improving. The Council on Revenues did project that the economy is growing, and so we were able to fund certain initiatives. Um, I think the most important thing we did was to replenish the Hurricane Relief Fund and the Rainy Day Fund. We put $50 million in each of those. And then we also are trying to deal with the unfunded liability with the Health Fund. Uh, the Health Fund, as you know, covers workers like yourself, and the unfunded liability is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So we put aside money, and we have a schedule now that hopefully down the road we will not necessarily fully fund the system, but it won't have the kind of unfunded liability it currently has. So that's good. They also uh, talked about the health fund as well, you know. So, yes. yeah, is there anything uh, else you want to add to that? Uh, well, no, yeah. basically yeah. He, he touched on it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I noted yeah. those same things. Yeah. Sure, that's um, why we played that too. Uh, right. Um, Professor Okamura? Anything? Well, they should be willing to use those emergency funds when there are emergencies, like uh, when uh, the schools were closed for 17 days. Mm -hmm. um, instead of waiting till the end of the session, why not at the start of the school year, mm -hmm. uh, knowing full well that the economy is going to recover at some point, and then, like what happened now, then the money could be re replenished. Yeah, and I remember uh, when that was going on, uh, I interviewed you uh, at the Senate, uh, at your office, and uh, you were also on the show, uh, Professor, I mean, uh, Senator uh, Sparrow. And um, uh, Professor Okamura was also, um, was involved in that kind of discussion. No, Roy came to our class, show, yeah. Roy came to our right. class too, right? Exactly, that's how yeah. we, uh, that was the connection, yeah. Mm -hmm. With Roy Takumi also mm -hmm. representative. And I know that, you know, during the furlough Friday incidents that you, you mentioned, the legislature did um, approach the, at that time, the administration with a number mm -hmm. of different options that could have, I believe, taken off um, at least a few days even, and then significant days in the end, um, at many steps in the game, whether it be tapping into the hurricane relief fund as we ultimately did um, towards the end, or even one of the things that I was really pushing for was utilization of the ARA Part B funds, mm -hmm. which was purely discretionary mm -hmm. um, for the governor at that point. I think it was about $35 million at that time in which she could use it for anything that she wanted to. And I think it actually went towards, it did go to some charter schools and some STEM initiatives, but I know that we said even a portion of that could start to take off even a few days mm -hmm. to just get us into session because we weren't in session mm -hmm. when furlough Fridays hit us, when the, the contract was agreed to. Um, so cut off a few days, get us to session, and then we can fast track some kind of bill in terms of the hurricane relief fund. But if you go back to that time, you'll recall, there was there was a lot of issues between the administration and the legislature at that time, so that even when we did end up passing the bill to allow us to tap into the Hurricane Relief Fund, she did not ultimately release those particular funds immediately, as I recall. I mean, it's a little fuzzy yeah. going back there, yeah. but um, th there were quite a bit of issues, and again, that's ultimately what did bring us to um, 2010's legislation, which had us put into statute the minimum amount of days and hours um, Act 167 that you know students would have instructional time mm -hmm. so that you would not see a return of furlough Fridays. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to Representative Takumi because he talked about uh, other bills that passed and others that didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be important and why did they didn't they and stuff like that. What we did here at the legislature, um, some good things. We obviously um, 
we didn't pass out the solar tax credit law, so it will still be done under the rules, which is unfortunate. Um, but we did do some things, um, like we managed to um, pass out a very innovative solar tax credit law that will allow people who rent to purchase solar systems, which up until now it's only been for home owners. So that's basically a middle class tax credit. And so now we'll allow renters to participate in this as well. Uh, we didn't do some things. The shield law for journalists and for bloggers, um, the House and the Senate couldn't come to an agreement. And so the bill will sunset. We had one of the most progressive shield laws in the country. That bill will sunset this year. So next year we have to come back and deal with that. We also didn't pass out a minimum wage bill, which was a big disappointment. As you know, state minimum wage is $7.25, the same as the federal minimum wage, and it hasn't gone up for six years. It was a proposal this year to increase it from $7.25 to $9.25 over four years. But the big sticking point was the tip credit. Hawaii is one of 40 plus states that have a tip credit. So if you work in a tipping type of job, such as in a restaurant, the employer can take off 25 cents currently off your pay. So if you're making $7.25, the employer can actually only pay you $7 and keep the 25 cents because the theory is you're making tips. Um, the Senate wanted to put that an 800% increase to $2. So um, the House really couldn't go along with that because if the minimum wage went from $7.25 to $9.25, but the employer could minus $2 for the tip credit, that worker would still be making $7.25 in two years. Uh, I do think we have to come back next year and take another look at that. These workers deserve a raise. There's 170,000 workers in our state who do not, who make the minimum wage and they deserve a raise like everybody else, particularly since their purchasing power has eroded over the past six years. Another bill that I introduced that um, didn't go very far, but I'm going to introduce it again this year, is a paid sick leave bill. People don't know that in the United States, which is a very wealthy country, only one state, Connecticut, has a paid sick leave law for workers who don't have paid sick leave. In Hawaii, over 200,000 workers don't have paid sick leave. Mainly, these are people who work in small restaurants, stores, and whatnot. And um, many people don't know that these workers don't have sick leave. So what happens? Say you're a single mom, and you have the flu, and you're working in a restaurant. You have a terrible choice to make. Either go to work and infect other people at work, or I hope you're not eating at that restaurant that day, <laughs> or stay home and not get paid. And when Connecticut did it, um, they did it about three years ago, um, it showed that one, morale goes up, two, the fear that people are gonna take, if I give you five days of sick leave, you will take all five days every year, is simply not true. And the reason we know that's not true is if you look at every company that offers sick leave to their workers, the vast majority of workers do not use the maximum allowable days of sick leave. They use it responsibly. Yeah, uh, here it is. What I'm interested in uh, asking you is uh, uh, what were some of the politics behind uh, like the minimum wage beyond uh, the question of uh, the tip law that, uh, or the law that governs the tips? And uh, in terms of the shield law, what was the politics behind that? Yeah. On the, the minimum wage, uh, there were two issues, as, mm -hmm. as um, Roy said. The first one was the tip credit, and the second one was tying it to the consumer price index mm -hmm. so that uh, depending on what and how that adjusted annually, um, the minimum wage would rise and fall based on that as well. And at the end of the day, in conference, um, they were not able to, mm -hmm. to come to a, a decision or something, a compromise. On this shield bill, the journalism bill, a big issue had to do with bloggers and how do we define a journalist? Mm -hmm. uh, because um, journalism today and the media, especially social media, is much different than our grandfather's mm -hmm. um, journalism. You know, it was very clear um, what journalists did, you know, the, the medium, the newspapers, the magazines, but now 
where anybody can start a blog, anybody can post items, um, confidential, sensitive, whatever the case may be. That was one of the big areas in terms of uh, um, whether those individuals get protected or, or what type of protections they get. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, yeah. I, I would add, too, that um, if you take a look at those particular measures that, that did not pass, those are very controversial issues, obviously. Those are not simple issues. They're very complex. They've got many parts to them. And I would just say, generally speaking, um, as chairs of committees um, with our counterparts in the House, um, a real important thing to remember is that um, much of the negotiation, much of the work on the bills actually takes place not during session, but in the interim period that we're in right now. And so, you know, if it doesn't pass in the very first year or even the second year, you know, it's time like this right now that needs to be focused on in terms of really starting to develop the bills. I'm very fortunate that Roy and I have a very good working relationship. I mean, we spend all the interim working on the various measures, going through the details. So by the time we actually start session and the bill is introduced, it's fairly, you know, it's been worked through. We've thought this through. We've worked with stakeholder groups. We've had many discussions with concerned individuals. We, we know different angles. Um, and so it's, it's much more mature at that point. And for many complex issues, that's really what it takes to help work it through the process is that good relationship with your, your counterpart um, from the subject matter perspective, as well as working it constantly, I think, throughout the interim. Because um, I think many people think it, just is from session to beginning to end. Mm -hmm. But actually, this is a, a very critical homework period mm -hmm. that we're in right now during right. the interim when we do a lot of our research about best practices across the country, um, what might work well locally, gathering stakeholder groups together, hearing their concerns, addressing them. And we do much of our work now. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm working on bills for next session already. Um, yeah. We just finished last mm -hmm. week. So it's not only four months. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, go ahead. And let me add, too. For some of the bills that uh, didn't pass, um, uh, because the economy was doing fairly well, uh, we didn't have to raise the general excise tax. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also talk of possibly raising the transient accommodation tax, the TAT. Um, however, we did not do that. However, we did make the 9.25% permanent um, versus lowering that. Um, the issue of GMO labeling was, mm -hmm. um, was quite... Um, quite loud, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, nothing happened there. And a measure that I introduced, if I may note, uh, had to do with um, red light cameras uh, and running red lights. Um, mm -hmm. And that bill made it um, all the way to conference, which it had never done in the past. However, um, it did stall in conference, and, and we'll see whether that has any chance next year or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did repeal the PLDC, the yeah, Public Land right. Development yeah. Corporation. That, that, very good. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, an issue that we passed last year. Um, however, uh, many people rallied against mm -hmm. it, although the intention was good. Mm -hmm. However, um, we got the message and we felt that, okay, let's relook at it and, and see if we can make it better. Uh, but at the end of the day, we just ended up repealing it. Um, there was a, also an effort for a public-private partnership authority. Mm -hmm. Um, some people, though, said that that's similar to the PLDC, which it really wasn't. But again, uh, we decided not to pass that, and you know, more discussion, as the senator says, can be um, had um, in the interim to see whether we could come up with a, a bill that, that might work. Yeah, because on the PLDC, since you mentioned it, um, that was good that it didn't, you know, I mean, you repealed that. But uh, in terms of the idea of public-private kind of entity, uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, natural resources and these kinds of resources that are like uh, basically uh, owned by the community, let's put it uh, through the state, um, I think uh, it would be best to keep it like uh, public because when you have uh, public uh, oversight uh, on it, uh, not only in terms of healing, but, you know, public uh, really uh, can uh, make decisions on that, it's better to... Um, you know, have just uh, it in the public realm so that it can be protected and no other like uh, extraneous kind of interest might uh, intervene and uh, might do damage without uh, uh, we knowing about it. Example, the PLDC, you, it was well intentioned, but you, uh, you had all kinds of problems. Well, I think the problem there was the outreach mm -hmm. and the education um, to the public. Um, uh, Many senators still think it's a good idea and they like to revisit it. Mm -hmm. um, however, 
you know, there is no intent to, to just turn things over to the private sector and let them do what they want or to exempt them from environmental laws and other issues that are of importance. So uh, you know, it's possible that something can be reworked, but again, it's going to take some time in the interim. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, another thing, uh, like um, I wanted to say, in terms of the uh, uh, tip credit law, I mean, if that was a hurdle uh, for you not passing the minimum uh, wage, for instance, is there might there be a way uh, in which we can, like, uh, or the tip credit law might be adjusted or something in such a way that uh, would make it uh, reasonable and logical to pass uh, minimum wage law, make it higher from 7.25 to whatever it is, yeah? Uh, well, I think the good part is, you know, we're at the beginning of a biennium period. Mm -hmm. And what that basically means is bills that um, failed to mm -hmm. pass this year, as long as they were not um, voted down completely, mm -hmm. will basically come back to life mm -hmm. at the beginning of next session, right where they ended up. Mm -hmm. um, for bills like that, we now know what perhaps some of those sticking points were. Mm -hmm and some of those areas of concern. So hopefully now would be the time to really start looking at those mm -hmm. issues, start to look for some compromises mm -hmm. and what people could agree upon so that when you get back into session in 2014, you starting off at a much greater point, hopefully mm -hmm. with some real agreements that everyone can just sit back down in conference and go, okay, we're ready to come to, to some agreement now. You know, we can, we can pass this. Mm -hmm. So um, in some respects, it's very good that we're at the beginning of the biennium mm -hmm. because it gives us um, you know, Another hindsight chance, yeah, yeah. to be able to really now perhaps do even better and, mm -hmm. and complete the job mm -hmm. in, in the next year. Yeah. Um, Professor Okamura, any comments on that or other bills that passed or didn't pass? Well, as we were talking earlier, <laughs> the one that we're concerned about was uh, not funding the faculty raises. Mm -hmm. not, not because I, I was counting on it. We haven't had a raise in four years. Yeah. But I know what's going to happen. They're just going to pass it on to the students. That's where the money will come from, the tuition that the students are paying now, the increase over the next five years. Yeah. Um, what I heard was Abercrombie did not request that in his budget. The government. Sent okay. to the legislature. Right. I don't know if you guys can confirm that or not. Uh, so it started with him, not necessarily among the legislators. Which but nobody caught it, uh, or they saw it, but they didn't uh, do anything. Right. He, yeah. he would send down a message right. uh, to the legislature, and we did never did get a message, is my understanding as well. So if you wanted to make a change to say a general fund for the raises versus to have it come from tuition and special fund, mm -hmm. he would have to make a, a conscious mm -hmm. message. General, a governor's message, which he does. If he wants to change certain things, he sends a, mm -hmm. a, a governor's message. Um, you know, and um, I do know, you know, having chaired the higher ed portion as well from a few years ago and having um, seen some of the discussions that in the past and, and probably still to this day, I would argue, there has been some concerns about the reserves in the tuition and fee special fund mm -hmm. um, being considerably high especially at Manoa, and not really being able to get some very firm numbers in terms of um, the accounting for that particular fund, in terms mm -hmm. of what's, a, what's the real reserve supposed to be. I mean, we recognize that having a healthy reserve is important for every institution for accreditation purposes, for operational purposes. But when you took a look at some of the balances, there was some, um, th there, I know that there was quite a concern, mm -hmm. especially given that you were Hundreds also- of millions, right? Um, pretty high. Over a hundred million, yeah, not okay. hundreds, but over hundred okay. million from a NOAA loan. And you, what you also had was a continuous, I think we've already ended the six year tuition increase mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. And then they were looking at an additional six mm -hmm. year tuition increase cycle. So it was kind of compounded at that point. So um, whether this particular move coupled, I think with also some calls for reports in terms of more information, I think it was more than likely a signal from the legislature saying, we. We need more information, mm -hmm. especially in regards to this particular fund, um, yeah. you know, and that there is money in this particular fund to be able to account for those types yeah. of things. So, um, in other words, one might look at it as an indirect sweep by the legislature of certain monies. Uh, whatever the reason for that, uh, I mean, I you give uh, certain reasons for it. I wouldn't call it indirect sweep, yeah. um, you know. And, and Adjustment. 
And, and, I, and, I, wouldn't, okay. and, I, and I wasn't the one in charge of that particular yeah, yeah, yeah. one. Yeah. But I will say this, yeah. that as everyone knows, there are blessings and burdens to autonomy at the same time, yes. right? When you, you made that autonomy ask you, and, and ask for the ability to control your mm -hmm. tuition, whether it to be set the rate and to keep it, you understood that part of the burden would also come that as other funds decreased, it would need to be supported by other mm -hmm revenues as well mm -hmm. and um, you know even when that particular six-year contract was awarded at a time when all of the other units were taking five percent mm -hmm. cuts the justification that was coming up from this administration at the, at the university was we have other revenues that can support this package and that's why we're going forward with it and I think um, that that message continues to to be heard as well. Yeah, the other thing, I mean, from my perspective, uh, you know, since I work at the UH Manoa, um, if we have so much money in the uh, like tuition fund, um, why are we raising? I mean, not for you to answer because <laughs> you know, just like a hypoth I mean, um, a question. Uh, why are we raising uh, these tuition? And we have a six-year plan to raise more tuition and so forth. Um, unless uh, those tuition, uh, f uh, the, the fund, f uh, tuition fund could be used uh, for CIP stuff, even though, like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I don't know, I mean, the technicality of that, but uh, what can you use the uh, tuition fund uh, for then if you don't use it for, like, uh, maintenance and other things or improving the um, quality of education and so forth? I mean, could you comment on this and enlighten us about that? Some of it would go towards scholarships, right, and, and assistance for students. Financial aid. Yes. Yeah, but uh, I mean, um, they've been increasing financial aid, but they still have more money. So why are we raising tuition? I well, mean, that's and, the and, thing. Well, no, everything's yeah. relative now. Yeah. It's a five-year um, tuition schedule now, but tuition will go up 32%, which is very modest. Yeah. Uh, University of California raised tuition 32% in one year in 2010, faced with mm -hmm. their budget crisis. The previous six-year cycle, tuition went up 140% over six years, $814 a year. So that's one of the reasons I didn't testify against the uh, tuition increase at the Board of Regents meeting. I have to keep my credibility yeah. because I saw that, wow, that's incredibly low. Yeah. So it, it may be what Jill said. Their university has this pool of money that they're not using, therefore didn't have to raise tuition so much. Mm. And again, I... I that's, you know, just what I've, you know, noted and some of the concerns that mm -hmm. we have heard, but I think that's also why what you do see in terms of some of the budget provisos is a call for more information so that yeah, as we continue yeah. on in terms of the supplemental year, we're able to really make a determination about um, what are in some of these funds mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I think it's important for everyone, and I do believe it's important for this you know, administration, even the university, and for the professors and everyone here, that we make sure that we keep our university affordable. I think that yeah, is important sure. and, at the core. I, think, yeah. I don't think we, any of us disagree yeah. on that. University officials, lawmakers, students, we all yeah. agree on that particular point. And I think the real question is, how do we all work together to, to get right. to that point where we still keep it affordable and support a first-rate university system? Yeah. Because I think uh, your point is valid regarding like you need more information on the tuition fund. That's one thing. The other thing, the comparison with other places like on the continental U.S. is valid up to a point. But be because, um, you know, the wages and salaries here are lower and so forth. So we cannot just compare it uh, uh, just like one on one kind of uh, thing. There is a 32 percent. Therefore, you know, in one year here, we raised it in 32% uh, in five years, but then look at the wages, you know, and the salaries, et cetera, and see like this way it become uh, unaffordable to a lot of people. And that's what we want to avoid, it seems to me. I mean, from your perspective, you know, on, on that. Speaking of wages and salaries, especially of administrators and um, executives within the UH, I believe the legislature has sent a, a clear message to the Board of Regents uh, that we do expect them to be more engaged. Uh, we do expect them to monitor better and to, to play the role um, where they are making the president, the chancellor, and all the higher ups accountable for their spending and costs. You know, mm -hmm. For example, the $195,000 librarian that 
that was hired um, really raised many eyebrows. Or if you look at the bonus package of the new athletic director, mm -hmm. and now that um, the president has uh, resigned or is planning on retiring, um, are we going to spend uh, another $100,000 plus to find uh, a new president when you could probably do it much cheaper with local talent and staff? So. Mm -hmm. Um, again, the cost of education uh, continues to rise, and and when UH administrators are, are getting paid considerably more than your your average professor, mm -hmm. um, you know, then yeah. questions and uh, uh, need to be answered. And and if we're not satisfied, uh, there could be consequences. Yeah. No, I, um, this is a sore point uh, among many of us in terms of the high salaries, etc. And to my, uh, from my perspective, squandering of money in, uh, like you know, headhunters and so forth, and other uh, other things as well. You know how money is squandered. So a lot of people uh, are not uh, satisfied with that. But then um, there's uh, it's not like really, <clears throat> although we live in a democratic society, uh, there's not much democracy <laughs> in terms of like I tell you what to do. Like I, you know, ex administrator tell you what to do and you got to do it, you know, that kind of stuff. This happens, I mean, I'm sorry to say, despite that we have like a, uh, you know, uh, 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 Senate, uh, you know, uh, faculty Senate and stuff like that, but uh, is it really advisory, is it not? I mean, how much you would listen to them and so forth, or every time you disagree with uh, uh, Administrator X, um, you cannot just go on strike because of that to make the point, you know. Right. So I, I think in terms of a public uh, university, um, public oversight uh, is uh, important. And, uh, you know, I share your uh, sentiments about that and your concerns, uh, in fact. Yeah. So um, I, to talk about the budget, um, I want to go to Representative Takumis, and he talked about budget agreements and how effective and efficient this legislature has been this time. So uh, we'll see, and then uh, your comments would be appreciated as well. You know, there was a big change. In my first years in office, the budget was done in a very efficient manner, but over the past, I'd say, 12, 14 years, it's really become very contentious and it would go until very late at night and the finance committee hearings used to go until two or three in the morning but I think uh, Sylvia Luke who's the new chair of the finance committee ran it very efficiently she worked very well with Senator David Ige the chair of the Ways and Means Committee so they actually agreed on the budget three days before the deadline which is a, it's very unusual that they do that usually you just wait to the very last minute and then you come to an agreement. So that was, I think, a very positive sign that um, people, we can work together, and as long as we keep in mind, it's really not our budget, actually. It's not our money. It's, it's the taxpayers of this state, and we owe it to them to be responsible and to come to some agreement on where these dollars should go. Um, the final budget came in about $250 million less than what the governor had requested. So even that showed a level of fiscal responsibility uh, because even though the economy is getting better, tourism is going up, the cost, uh, the sales of homes and cars, which is usually the indicators to show that the economy is improving, uh, is also going up. But we still should be prudent and cautious. And we'll see next year where we are. Yeah, any comments? Yes, we must be prudent and cautious. Uh, that's certainly yeah. the case. Uh, you know, at the federal level, there's much going on, and the sequestration issue is mm -hmm. still being debated and discussed. And with the um, passing of Senator Dan Inouye, um, our, our influence in Washington, D.C. Uh, has diminished, and we're probably not going to be getting uh, the appropriations we had gotten in the past. So uh, we do have to still tighten the belt and hopefully um, the recovery will continue, although it may be slower than we all want and expect. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I'm hearing that um, we're getting you know, a certain amount of Chinese tourists coming mm -hmm. in now. Um, they're making real estate 
purchases that they weren't making mm -hmm. before, and, and there are some promising signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, the, the other thing is that um, we, um, since like uh, Hawaii became a state and even before, uh, we, were, we have been relying on tourism, um, maybe construction, military, and so forth, which are important uh, legs of the uh, economy. But uh, uh, could we do something else uh, in terms of the economy so that we can have like more revenues, etc., beyond the uh, tourism and beyond uh, the military? Although the military brings in money, but now with, uh, again, Senator uh, Inouye Natir, might bring fewer dollars than before. I don't know. I mean, but is there any way like you folks are thinking about uh, to improve the economy and uh, like broaden uh, the base? You know? Well, I know that what we did do is invest um, six million dollars into our, the high growth initiative mm. as well, which is really starting to look at the development of new industries. Um, here in Hawaii from a venture capitalist perspective. And that's, I think, really going to be able to dovetail and work well with the innovation initiative that the university has really taken on. And I think we can't um, ignore the fact that the university system, and not to play to both of you, mm -hmm. isn't a strong economic generator as well. I mean, you take a look at it from a research perspective. You know, we're bringing in over $400 million mm -hmm. of research into this state um, at this point. I think last year alone, we're probably going to go close to half a billion dollars mm -hmm. this year um, through the system. I mean, that's really significant. We're actually right there up with Berkeley mm -hmm. at this particular point as a research one institution. Mm -hmm. So I think you take a look at the ability for that to be able to create jobs, spin off new industries, knowledge-based industries. Um, that's huge. And that's, I think, where we should really be applying a lot of the focus. And I think with the high growth initiative, with the init innovations initiatives that the, the campuses are doing here, with the, the research coming in, that has, I think, the most potential for us to really start to move forward. Um, it's also great that we actually have a chief information officer for the state, and we're starting to really put money and investments towards our state infrastructure, our IT infrastructure, so that as we get these knowledge-based industries and we get all of this going on too, we're gonna have the capacity to support all of that. And so. Um, I would say perhaps that's going to be the next leg of the stool that we're looking at to support mm -hmm. the economy. Um, not negating the other ones, the traditional ones mm -hmm. that have held us up, mm -hmm. but definitely looking at those sustainable industries that we've always talked about. But I think finally you're starting mm -hmm. to see some real numbers, especially, mm -hmm. like I said, when you look at the fact that, you know, the UH system is bringing close to half a billion dollars in research. Mm -hmm. um, that's not just test tubes and microscopes. That's mm -hmm. real dollars, that's mm -hmm. jobs, that's coming into the state. Mm -hmm. And I think the potential for that is astronomical when you think of you know, TMT and other things as well. Mm -hmm. That can go so much higher. Yeah, especially when tourism, like uh, a lot of minimum wage jobs are in tourism, et cetera. We don't want those ones to, uh, you know, to increase necessarily. We need the other job. yeah, jobs. Yeah, and right. I think that's what those knowledge-based sectors right. that can give right. us. Yeah, and in terms of diversifying our, our economy, we've, we've been working on diversifying our economy for many years. But, you know, tourism, military, and construction will, will probably be the troika of um, jobs and the engine that moves forward. But we're also investing in, you know, agriculture and, and sustain, sustainability, you know, technology, um, aerospace. Uh, mm -hmm. This year we put some money in to building our fashion industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at um, increasing the tax credit for the film industry, which enhances tourism and complements tourism. You know, we've been trying to get more sports events and other um, um, events that um, can bring international um, tourists and mm -hmm. those from the mainland. So there will be multiple, many niche markets that we can support. Mm -hmm. but. Um, from my perspective, you know, tourism will, will always be our golden egg. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, a big one that's coming up, for example, hopefully within three to five years, you'll be hearing about space tourism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with space tourism, you know, now we're dealing with STEM, science, technology, mm -hmm. education, and mathematics, and, and robotics, and, and space exploration, Pisces, um, a program. I'm on the big island that's looking at lunar research and space exploration. So there are opportunities for us and areas that we can um, certainly um, take advantage of being where we're located, um, that bridge between Asia and the mainland. 
Yeah, let me uh, problematize this a little bit by saying, uh, as you have uh, started, like we've been, uh, I mean, I've been uh, hearing about diversification since uh, uh, Jack Burns time, you know, and uh, yet uh, we have been, uh, I mean, not discounting all this stuff that we have been doing, but uh, there's something structural that uh, is a hurdle in terms of us trying to, uh, say, uh, go and uh, have uh, reached the tipping point in which like we will have like uh, other kind of industries that are really uh, that generate uh, a lot of good jobs etc so I, I don't know how what would you say what, what do you think about that I mean the structural constraints that we might have you know in terms of the economy um, because I mean a lot of stuff uh, that uh, Hawaii uh, is like uh, cannot uh, initiate, uh, you know, in terms of uh, global economy, et cetera, et cetera. It's subject to the whims of the global economy, if you will. Other people who are, uh, or other players, big corporations, et cetera, that uh, really um, call the shots. And so how would we be able to figure something out to uh, go to the tipping point and have a better, a better uh, jobs for a lot uh, more people than we are generating currently. Well, I, I think that's where you have to, to find that niche, mm. because you know, the world does not rotate around Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, internationally, Asia, Europe, South America, all economies, all jurisdictions are wanting to do what we want to do, you know, to help our communities prosper, have jobs for our residents, and we need to find those areas. So for example, astronomy, we have found a niche there. You know, we are probably the premier location of observing the galaxies and stars um, because of our location. So it's areas like that that we need to identify mm -hmm. and see where we can make it benefit us. and. We're not going to create jobs with these new uh, diverse areas like in tourism where you've got tens of thousands of jobs. Mm -hmm. But if we could create a thousand jobs in one area or two thousand in another mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, then they do add up mm -hmm. and they'll give our residents more opportunities. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. And paying jobs. And I, I yes. think, you know, um, to build upon what um, you know, Will was saying, I think one of the critical components that I don't want to say has been missing but is so important if an industry is going to take off is that you have the skilled workforce present to be able to make sure that once those jobs are created, you have people here that can fill it. Mm -hmm. Because so often the challenges they're facing is, I need this type of technician or this type of skill set. How can I draw them to Hawaii? And they don't want to come to Hawaii because of the various cost of living, other mm -hmm. issues. It's so much more sustainable. It makes so much more sense. It's good for our local people. Mm -hmm. If we can make sure that as part of growing this industry, we make sure we're educating them to put them into those particular high paying, mm -hmm. good, new sector jobs mm -hmm. and you know for one example i have a dream of making the national defense university partner with uh west oahu to have satellite degree offerings like they do with other private and public universities across mm -hmm. the country why are we uh west oahu because the fbi headquarters is going to be built out in that particular area you have got the sea rider productions in that particular area you've got various military operations that are going to be popping up in Kapolei. now you have a university that's a satellite that can offer cybersecurity degrees mm -hmm. online um, you now create the place where you can have the educated workforce created and you would have a natural place where you could build up the industries because they're already building themselves up mm -hmm. so instead of having to bring in workers our local kids can fill those jobs through the education they're going to get right here at home. And I think that's really a critical component is the workforce mm -hmm. capacity and making sure that we make sure our students have what they need to fill those good jobs. Mm -hmm. yes. Professor Okamura, I mean, comments on that? Well, I think one of the uh, areas that could really be developed is a cancer research center or the kind of vision that uh, Dean Cadman had before. Mm -hmm at the School of Medicine for making that into a university research park. Unfortunately, because um, his own illness, that vision never really materialized, but uh, that to me was really the kind of area in which uh, we create, create these knowledge intensive jobs for young people, like you just mentioned, uh, who graduate from the university and can go to work in places like that. Uh, about a year ago, I met a student graduated from chemistry 
from Hanoi, and she, she got a job at the Cancer Research Center. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's exactly that kind of situation that I think we need to develop. Having said that, why doesn't the governor put more money into the university then? Everybody knows this. Mm -hmm. The university is, brings in more than a million dollars a day mm -hmm. to the economy of Hawaii. That's the difference between the university as a state agency and every other state agency. Their responsibility is not to generate funds, but faculty do this. Mm -hmm. That's one of the rationales one can give is why we got our uh, pay deduction return mm -hmm. as compared to all the other public worker unions. Having said that then, well, the governor should support the university with these kinds of monies for developing these kinds of areas to diversify the economy in areas that the expertise already exists here. Yeah. One of our cameramen is already here in computer science. Yeah. You know, this is the kind of people looking for a job after they graduate. Yeah, and then like creating more jobs like 1,000 here, 300 there, etc. that would really uh, make a dent in uh, fighting poverty. Uh, so. <laughs> What I wanted to ask, like uh, in terms of legislation or uh, funds that were given to um, nonprofit organizations that really try to alleviate poverty, etc. Anything has anything been done uh, on that? Yeah. Well, we did. I believe um, was it ten million dollars in GIA. Ten million dollars in operating. Right, uh, where we fund nonprofits, um, but uh, across the whole spectrum. Um, for example, um, if I may just read a few, yeah, um, sure. you know, Bishop Museum Energy Improvements, $2 million. Oahu Veterans Council, $2 million. Seagull Schools Child Care, $1.2 million. You know, Hawaii Public Television Foundation, $2 million. Uh, the Those young are the capital ones. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, so yes. So, yeah. so we had granted yeah. aids for the, the capital improvement for the bricks and mortars, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I only recognize the Seagull School ones, but we also had operating GIAs yeah, for reading list, programs, right, no. for homeless yeah. outreach, mm -hmm. for um, domestic violence, various, various okay. other programs mm -hmm. um, to really, again, stretch that public dollar farther because nonprofits really know how to work yeah. and make sure mm -hmm. that they get the most for their money. Mm -hmm. I think that's really critical. But I did want to touch upon one point that you raised about the governor should be going in there and investing the money in the university. One of the things I've really pushed for in the past was performance-based funding. And I know the university has approached the legislature about doing performance-based funding as well as, as a certain mm -hmm. pot of money. Um, as they reach certain goals, they get rewarded with that on a campus basis. And I know the community colleges are piloting it right now. Mm -hmm. So far, the performance funding mechanism they've approached the legislature with has been based on your strategic plan. Perhaps they need to broaden that beyond the strategic plan to other types of deliverables that the state might have as an interest in terms of economic generation or industry building, research, and other things so that um, we can really see the nexus to our overall state viability. Um, because I think performance-based funding would be perhaps an excellent way for us to really start to put some real dollars towards investing in the university and you could really start to see the return on investment yeah. there. We so have, yeah, we have uh, less than a minute, uh, but uh, you know, hopefully like, uh, <clears throat> because this is the beginning of the biennium, um, hopefully like the wage increase, uh, the minimum wage increase would uh, happen and try to uh, get rid of all those hurdles uh, through compromise or what have you. Uh, the sick leave, uh, the paid sick leave is very important. And also more funding, uh, you know, um, not only for the university um, along the lines that Professor Akamura talked about it, uh, but, uh, you know, more funding for uh, people who, uh, and organizations, nonprofits, etc., that uh, uh, alleviate uh, poverty um, and, like, you know, make sure, like, everybody is, has a health insurance, uh, whether it's public or what have you. I think these are important uh, things that we could do. And um, I want to thank you also for uh, supporting education and supporting uh, public safety. And uh, I heard um, that you're going to uh, you thinking about running for Congress or? Yeah. We're having some serious discussions yeah. okay. with some people now Great. and yeah. we'll see. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you for uh, our viewers. Uh, mahalo Nuiloa, we'll see you uh, in the fall. Thank you.